McKenna's education, where we inform people and equip people about the gospel and how to spread good news to others. The happy gospel, we like indeed. to say. Uh, it is indeed a happy gospel. And in fact, we're in evangelicalizing evangelicalism, <laughs> I say sometimes. So often we, we need to take a look at uh, where we were and where we're going um, and how we can best serve each other. Um, so that's, that's that stuff I've been um, experiencing lately, too, is just how to articulate the good news hmm. um, of the gospel uh, without, what, what is it? Um, Paul said it's scandalous news. The gospel is, can be offensive, you know, to, to the Pharisee, to, to the religious, to people that have a set way. And I know I was there too, where I had this narrow view of looking at the world and as Jesus as our savior. And then my, and then slow, for me, it was a slow process of, you know, detailing the confusion uh, that was thrown in by um, just mixed, mixed religion um, and not really understanding um, the grace of God. For me, that's that's where I got um, very lost. And, mm. confused. and my hope is that we can keep it very simple for people so so they know uh, just how good and loving and caring God is. And what the message of the gospel means to you. So, yeah, without further ado, let's let's go there. Let's talk about um, Jesus and uh, your walk. So just give us a brief um, background, who you are and how you came to know the, the love of God, your life. Yeah, my name is George Saris. And um, I, I, uh, I guess it, it goes... I, my mom was very instrumental in my upbringing in terms of leading me to God. Um, interestingly, before I was born, she was part of a, uh, an ethnic group. I'm Greek, all Greeks own restaurants, actually, uh, and all Greeks are philosophers. But uh, my father did own a restaurant, and he was sort of a philosopher as well. But um, my mom and dad got married in 1941 just before, or actually as, yeah, it was just before World War II broke out for the United States. And so my father uh, went off to uh, war and uh, then came back and they um, tried to have some children. And interestingly, um, they were not able to have kids. Uh, in fact, the doctor told my mother and my father that uh, my dad could not have children. And as part of an ethnic group, um, that was not a good thing. And uh, there were people that were in the, the Greek community uh, that really told me, actually they told my mom that she was cursed because she couldn't have children. She had a couple of miscarriages and didn't seem to be able to have any children. So she was talking and sharing her heart with a friend one day. Um, and her friend, a Roman Catholic woman said, uh, why don't you take out a novena? Novena means nine. And uh, what, that entailed was my mother going to a Catholic church nine weeks and praying that God would enable her to conceive a child. She did that once a week. She went to this Roman Catholic church and prayed that God would enable her to conceive. After that, she did conceive and she went back for nine more weeks to thank God for enabling her to conceive and to pray that this child that she had conceived would end up becoming uh, a healthy child. And then after I was born, she went back for nine more weeks to thank God for giving her a healthy child. Uh, 18 months later, my brother was born. And uh, I share that because I'm convinced God wanted me to be born. And I'm convinced that God wanted my brother to be born. And I'm convinced that God wanted you, Nissa, and every other person who exists on this planet to be born. He has a purpose for all of us. And uh, that was just kind of a, a way to say to me, as I heard my mom share that, that, wow, I guess I am important. And so is everybody else. It doesn't make any difference how you were born or where you were born. God is the one who enables a child to be conceived and grow into uh, become a child. 
So anyway, um, as I grew up, my dad was actually a very good dad, and he was um, a loving father, and uh, he was not as religious. My mother taught me how to love God. My dad taught me how to be a father, and um, the two of them together worked very well. And so as I got, I made a profession of faith at some point in my younger years, probably around, I don't know, somewhere between nine and 12 years old, my church, but I didn't really understand what that meant. And uh, so I went to college, and when I was in college, I began to see my, myself stray away from biblical principles. Uh, I was not around, I went to college from 1966 to 1970 during the height of the drug culture and the Vietnam War era. Uh, I did not get involved in drugs. I did not get involved in a lot of junk that was going on during that time, but I could see that my heart was moving away from God. And uh, at the end of my junior year in college, I met a group of people that had a different quality of life than I did. I was worried about the future. I was uh, very concerned that we were just heading down the wrong path. Uh, we had rioting in the streets back in the late 60s. Um, there were people that were killed from the, during the riots. And uh, I just was very, very fearful. But these people weren't fearful. And I talked with them and they attributed it to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, with God. And uh, so I, uh, I talked with him further, and the, a young man named Conrad Cook invited me over for popcorn one night, and uh, he shared a little book that called, Have You Made the Wonderful Discovery of the Spirit-Filled Life? It was produced by Campus Crusade for Christ. The basic message that I got out of it was, God is the boss, you are the servant. I used to wonder, um, is God um, like Aladdin's genie? If you just rub the lamp the right way, you get all this awesome power at your disposal. Is he like Santa Claus? You know, he gives you good things if you're good, and he gives you coal if you're bad. Is he like uh, a divine watchmaker who just sort of set the universe in place and uh, just let it run? And what happened as I share, as I talked with this man, Conrad Cook, I said, no. The reason I'm not getting answers to prayer is that I'm trying to be the boss of my own life instead of letting God be the boss of my life. That is, I would follow his plan, then I would experience the, the power that he has available to those who walk with him. And so I was really excited. I mean, it changed my whole life. And it was uh, exciting. I went on uh, Campus Crusade for Christ staff for four years after that, and uh, then went to seminary. And during those four years in, in, uh, at the uh, Campus Crusade, and then as I got into seminary, an issue bothered me. I just couldn't conceive of how God, who's all loving, all wise, all powerful and good, either cause or allow billions of people to suffer consciously forever. That just didn't seem to make sense to me. And as I thought about my father, one of the things that became very clear to me, my father and my mother would never abandon me. As I grew up, uh, they would discipline me, and sometimes fairly forcefully, but I knew they'd never abandon me, no matter what I did. And I couldn't conceive that God would be less loving and less of a father than my own father. And so uh, I had never read anything that was different from that. And so I um, decided at the end of my uh, last year in seminary to uh, uh, use that topic as a subject of a research. So I did. And I never read anything different than that. I mean, everything I read was that hell was never ending conscious torment for those who did not accept Christ in this life. So I. Uh, but it bothered me. So I did the research. And uh, toward the end of it, I came across a book called History of Opinions on the Scriptural Doctrine of Retribution by a man named Edward Beecher. He was a brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe. And um, his book was written in 1878, exactly 100 years prior to when I was writing my paper. And he pointed out that in the early Christian church, for about the first 500 years of the church, a dominant view, according to him, the dominant view was that God would ultimately restore all of creation, that hell was temporary in its duration and remedial in its nature, that ultimately everyone would get into heaven. 
it was through Christ, but physical death did not end when God worked in a person's life. God continues to work in a person's life even after death in this in the ages to come. I was excited. Wow. I've never heard this before. No one's ever told me this. And I never I got, heard a particular man either. Harry Beecher Stowe's hus- uh, brother? brother? Brother. His name yeah. was Edward Beecher. Yeah, yeah. And he was actually, he was actually yeah. pastor for um, uh, a, a church that is still very prominent in the Boston area uh, for four years. He went to Yale Divinity School. He was a brilliant man. He went out to uh, mm-hmm. Illinois and he was a very strong abolitionist. And uh, so he was you know, promoting that as well. Uh, it, it was pretty amazing. But anyway, so he kind of led me to understand that if this is something that was true in the early church, and then he also pointed out some areas of scripture that uh, would give this strength to the argument. And so I wrote my paper. I got an A minus on my paper. I was very excited that I had discovered something. And so I went to my professors and um, I shared it with a couple of the professors that I knew, my advisor and another man I really respected tremendously. And they looked at me sort of patronizingly and said, well, you know, George, good job. You did a nice job in your paper. But what you don't realize is that in the interim time, after the first 500 years until now, uh, we have discovered that that view is incorrect. Mm-hmm. Well, I felt a little bad about that, but I thought, I don't think that's, I don't think they're right. <laughs> I kept it as a private hope for a lot of years. And oh. uh, in 2007, decided to uh, revisit the topic. I knew I had to at some point, make it available, make people aware of this view, because it was a, it's not a new view. Somebody right. said, I think it was uh, Charles Spurgeon, that if it's new, it's not true. If it's mm. true, it's not new. Mm. Well, this was not new, and it's true. It's like, mm. wow, that was really exciting. So anyway, I um, started doing some more research and uh, ended up writing a book. Um, the title of the book is Heaven's Doors Wider Than You Ever Believe. And yeah. uh, if anybody that's listening to this wants to get it, you can go to Amazon.com and uh, I think you'll find it uh, quite easily. I, I've kept it as inexpensive as I can. I, I sell it at the lowest price Amazon allows. <laughs> so I think it's $9.99. Something like that for the, for the book. But interestingly, also, it was awarded the Silver Medal in Theology and the Illumination Book Awards. Nice. And, so uh, it actually, um, it, it's a, a book. Yeah. Wow, I, didn't, I did not know that. I didn't know about the award. Now, how do they, how do they assess the awards and stuff? Is that um, through the colleges or? Um... I have no idea. All I know is that they uh, had a, a, awesome. they put out an uh, invitation for people to submit books. And then yeah. They, their work and I found out that I was awarded the silver medal in theology <laughs> it was 2018 oh, how validated being rejected you know <laughs> I know that was kind of exciting um, funny. yeah funny. as a result of my book it was interesting even before I published my book when people started finding out of what I believed I couldn't continue in my church uh, as a member of my church um, the what, elders what church were you what, what I, I don't want to I don't want to put it down, so I'm not going to tell you what it was, but it was an evangelical it's church. Evangelical Baptist church? or um, No, it was uh, a different denomination, but it was along those lines, you know, okay. definitely a, a conservative evangelical church. Okay. And um, so I, uh, and I had been an elder. In fact, it was interesting because when they asked me to be an elder, actually, when they asked me to, when I was talking about joining the church, uh, I talked to the pastor and I gave him a copy of my paper that I had written in 1978. And uh, he read it, and he said, wow, I've never heard this. Um, just don't talk to me. <laughs> it happened with another church as well. And oh. so, um, uh, but when, uh, what happened was I was um, talking, uh, I didn't talk about it a lot, but I was mm-hmm. doing some research, and uh, a woman that we know, actually we knew quite well, um, found out about what i I uh, had written or what I was writing and she complained to the elders and said, how can George Saris continue to be a member of this church? He doesn't believe what the doctrinal statement says, which was legitimate. 
And so one of the elders came uh, one night and talked with me about it and said, uh, George, don't really know what to do. Mm. You've got a really active part of the church. Your family is um, well-respected in the church, but uh, just can't continue to have you as a member. So mm. I, we just, my wife and I just decided to quietly submit our resignation and leave. I was working at the time um, with an organization uh, to um, Christian organization. I was working kind of part-time to media professionals and outreach to media professionals. And um, I sent a copy of my manuscript to the person in charge of that. And he uh, terminated me three days later. Uh, doctrinal aberration. Um, my wife and I were very active in a, a ministry to uh, international students, and we couldn't continue that. Uh, we were invo involved in a, a couple's Bible study. They asked us not to come. Um, so there's been, a, I, I lost friends. I lost, and what's interesting, you know, it's a people that I thought would have been excited about this were not. Mm -hmm. People that I thought would be turned off by this I'm excited about it. It's kind of interesting, you know, uh, different than I expected uh, some of these people. I but, love it. When God does that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, Ooh, surprise. So um, anyway, it's been a, a, an interesting journey since that time. I, I, that was back in uh, around 2012 that happened with my church. I didn't get the book published till 2017. We kept on working. I got turned down by 28 different publishers. Um, Christian publishers, they didn't want to even touch it. Yeah. Uh, and the secular publishers were saying, George, who? <laughs> How are we ever going to sell books by somebody that nobody knows? So, um, but I was very encouraged and it's, it's done well. Um, it was actually an Amazon bestseller when it first came out. And so uh, God has been very gracious. Yes, that's so, so good to hear. And I had a question, uh, just as you were speaking, it made me think about it, that because um, your theology didn't line up with the doctrines. Um, so according to the elders there, um, wh what are the doctrines? Because I, I thought um, like the Nicene Creed or the Apostles Creed, even in the creeds, there's nothing that states about eternal damnation. Nothing that I'm aware of. That's and, absolutely and, correct. That's so, absolutely correct. But yeah. what happened is most churches, organizations add on to, they don't just go back to the uh, Nicene Creed. Interestingly, the Nicene Creed is the only creed that is officially determined to be the correct creed by the entire Christian church at the time. Mm -hmm. They actually said that um, uh, no other creeds can be offered uh, to change this, which was really kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. but everybody adds stuff to it. You know, we have Almost every church has a statement of faith. Yeah, okay. So. They add all kinds of things to their statement of faith. And um, it's usually, you know, if you're evangelical, uh, about the Trinity, about the deity of Christ, um, becoming, those kinds of things. But most of them add, almost every one of them, add that those who uh, accept Christ in this life will experience heaven. Those who do not will be punished forever in hell. Hmm. So that's really where the, the issue comes down. And uh, I like to call them statements of distinctives as opposed to, opposing to uh, statements of faith mm -hmm. because really the only true statement of faith for the Christian church is the Nicene. That mm -hmm. has nothing to do with it. And interestingly, a person who added the phrase, we believe in the life of the world to come to the Nicene Creed, his name was Gregory of Nyssa. And mm -hmm. he was a strong believer that God would ultimately restore all of creation. Right. Yes. That right. probably the strongest of all the ancient um, scholars and uh, theologians that were part of the early Christian church. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm just looking at it right now, just kind of rereading it myself here. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah I love this. Um, let me get that. Talked about judgment, and by the way, there's nothing that says that judgment has to be what kind of judgment it is. Um, if I go to, uh, if I get a um, traffic summon and I have to go before a, uh, a court, I'm not going to get the death penalty. It just depends on what the crime is. The crime, uh, the penalty has to fit the crime. 
And so uh, not every crime is going to get whatever punishment people think. But we've got this idea in the evangelical world that if you don't receive Christ now in this life, then that's it. God basically abandoned you. Yeah. You're a Calvinist. You believe that God chose certain people to be saved and chose not to give that salvation to others. If you're an Arminian, you believe that God wants everyone to be saved, but is not able to accomplish it. So I think the Calvinists limit God's love. The Arminians limit God's power. Right. Whereas this view, I believe, is true to scripture and uh, also uh, it shows who God really is. God is a God of, he's all wise, all powerful, all loving, and he's good. That's it. And so why would you not expect that you would be able to start out with a creation that was very good and end with a creation that is very good? Right, right. Beautiful. Um, and my question was for you. Um, do you think some of this stems from Arianism, like just the, the heresy that the Trinity is divided? Because I feel like even in the evangelical churches, um, it, you know, they give lip service to the Trinity often, but like even even my daughter, you know, sometimes, you know, will come home from like um, a Bible study somewhere and someone will say something to her and she'll pick up on it if it's not right. Because, you know, I've been drilling this in since she was little that, you know, so she doesn't fall into a snare, but um, she does sometimes hear um, a Bible teacher say something like, um, you know, Jesus is, uh, is sitting next to the father and he's, and he's petitioning for you, you know, praying for you. And then the father's next to Jesus, like, like uh, implying bigger and greater and Holy Spirit's in everyone, but we don't, but I, I, and when she said something like he, he's in everyone, but Jesus isn't in everyone, you know, you have to ask him into your heart. And then he, as, as if he just comes in now, and then if you sin, you know, what does he leave you and come back, you know? So it makes it super confusing for little kids, you know, when you're trying to explain this. And even at a Methodist church, um, I was told you don't have to, explain the trinity to little kids they can learn that later um but i totally disagree like you know it's it's going to be a mystery now and forever you know just because you're older it doesn't mean you know we're going to understand it more just because we're older and you know have some wisdom it's still a mystery but the three and one i just i find it so important because when jesus died on the cross you know christ christ was god was in christ reconciling the world to himself that's a big that's something so vital to know that it wasn't um, like the penal substitution, you know, that, that atonement theory, I think um, has really thrown a monkey wrench into it. Like, Oh, yeah, so I agree with you on that. I think that um, from my perspective, it's not so much Arianism, by the way, Jehovah's witnesses are basically Arians. That's yeah. what they believe that, that yeah. Jesus was a created being. Um, and I think some Jehovah's witnesses may even believe, I actually, I don't really know. I haven't studied enough of what, going on there. I think what actually happened was that in the Western church particularly, because in the Eastern church, you hear much more talk about the Trinity than you do in the Western church, um, and especially uh, not as much in the Protestant church. But what happened was God the Father became so distant that we needed to do something. So the Roman Catholics decided, well, we've got to get married in there because Mary is tender. She can talk to her son and, you know, speak on um, our behalf to her son to in, uh, uh, intercede for us, kind of that idea. Um, well, the Protestant church basically does the same thing, but with Jesus, you know, that Protestant message, unfortunately, and I'm a, a strong evangelical, I believe the inerrancy of scripture, and uh, I believe in the, the basic tenets of the, the uh, evangelical faith, but what they've tended to do is make God so distant that he doesn't really love you. God, the Father, hates you. God, the Son, loves you. And therefore, God, the Father, is going to beat up on his Son so that we can then be accepted into his presence. Yeah. That, to me, is just crazy because uh, God is one, um, right. not separate. Uh, in fact, one of the things I say in, um, I think, in my book is that uh, the, maybe my I'm writing another book right now, oh. um, but um, the, the the significance of the Trinity 
doctrine is that God himself loves you. He didn't love you enough to send a, a messenger, send someone like an angel uh, come and, and uh, tell you about who he was and how and redeem you. He himself came because mm -hmm. he himself loves you. He's not like uh, Islam where God is separate. He sends a prophet, Muhammad, and then Muhammad talks to you and he can tell you about God. But Jesus didn't say, uh, God is the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, come to God, and he will give you rest. He said, come to me, and I will give you rest. I am the, uh, uh, the bread of life. I am the, the living water. So he was always drawing attention to himself. Why? Because he was God. And uh, it was showing, I think, us, as well as the people, obviously, who, who saw Jesus, that God himself loves us that's what's amazing yeah that was really what i got from my father you know as i thought about my dad i thought my dad loves me hmm. he would never abandon me right and so i thought well how could god be different and that's hmm. what's, what really motivated me to do the research and i was so excited to find out that uh that was the belief of the early christian church the dominant belief in the early christian church and then as time went on it kind of strayed away I think what's happened is that we've kind of made God into this being that we can't really interact with. You interact with Jesus, but not the Father. And mm -hmm. God the Father doesn't really like you, but Jesus does. And so therefore we get to God the Father through Jesus, but they're not really all the same. So I think you're you're right in the sense of we've abandoned kind of belief in the Trinity. It was interesting in one of the more liturgical churches that I've been a part of it at one time in my life. Um, they talk about, uh, instead of in Jesus' name, it'll be in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Which I thought was really quite interesting. I thought, we don't hear that in the evangelical church. Mm -hmm. We hear it only in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's where that is. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, so good. Like the early church fathers and uh, even St. Athanasius, right? Um, right. Was a big uh, yeah, Athanasius uh, probably believed in ultimate restoration. Um, no. he, he was a very strong supporter of origin, and uh, he was a strong. He's made some statements that indicate that he was, but he didn't come out specifically to say that. Gregory mm -hmm. of Nyssa came out specifically. Origin came out specifically. A man by the name of Theodore Mopsu of Mopsuestia came out specifically. Uh, Diodorus of Tarsus came out specifically to mm -hmm. say that. Um, there's a wonderful book. Uh, 960 pages or something by a very scholarly book by a woman named uh, Ilaria Ramelli who's gone into um, uh, the early documents and she reads like all these different languages you know she reads Syriac she reads Greek she reads Latin she reads you know all this stuff and um, what she's pointed out is a lot of people will say to you that the early church believed in endless hell because they misunderstand the meaning of the Greek word that is translated as eternal. That mm -hmm. word is um, ion in the Greek, in the Hebrew it's olam. And interestingly, it does not mean never ending. What it means is the end is not known. So for example, I, I've often used the illustration that if you stand, because uh, we live in Connecticut, right? You go down to the ocean and you look out, it looks like the ocean goes on forever. It doesn't mm -hmm. really go on forever. There's an end somewhere, which is we don't know where that end is. Well, that's the, the idea of Ion and Olam is we don't know. It may be shorter or longer. We just don't know when the end is. So one of the ways that is translated is um, the age to come, or uh, divine, like the, the big uh, verse of scripture that supports endless punishment is Matthew 25, 46, where it says, Jesus is giving a parable and he says, these will go into eternal or everlasting life. These will go into eternal or everlasting punishment. Mm -hmm. Well, what that should be translated is, these will go into life in the age to come. These will go into punishment in the age to come. Or these will experience divine life. These will experience divine punishment. But it doesn't say anything about the duration of that punishment mm. or the nature of that punishment. 
And the nature of that punishment probably is, not probably, I'm convinced that it actually is, is restorative. Um, the lake of fire, for example, fire was not new, used primarily to destroy things, it was used to purify things in the ancient world. So the, ancient, so the, the lake of fire is a purification fire, a purifying fire. And uh, so people are thrown into the lake of fire or the devil and his angels into the lake of fire for the purpose of purifying, not just destroying. And it all, it even says all will be salted with fire. That's and correct. All um, people, like all liars, thieves. There's one passage in Revelation: all liars, thieves, um, adulterers, and it makes a list of all these sins will be in the lake of fire. And I'm thinking, well, I've lied. Those are passages that I, I, even right off the bat, you know, you got to look at it and say, well, what does this mean? All means all. Also, keep in mind at the end of the book of Revelation, it's really quite interesting because you have the uh, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven, yeah. right? And it says specifically, the gates of the new Jerusalem are never shut. Never shut, yeah. The water of life that is flowing in the uh, in the tree of life that is in the new Jerusalem, uh, the, the tree gives its uh, fruit all 12 months, every 12 months. So it's always available. The water of life is always available. And then at the very end of the book of Revelation, you have the spirit says, to those who are outside, mm -hmm. come and drink of the water of life, eat of the tree of life, and mm -hmm. enter the, the New Jerusalem. Well, who's mm -hmm. outside? Mm -hmm. Those same people that a few verses earlier um, were thrown into the lake of fire. Because it right. says, the, uh, the uh, uh, like you said, the, the adulterers, the liars, the whoremongers, or whatever it is, uh, are thrown into the lake of fire. Well, that's what it says. And then it says, those who are outside the gates, that's where the lake of fire is, mm -hmm. are invited to come in. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. The believers are those, in fact, it says the spirit and the bride say, come. Well, the spirit is obviously the Holy Spirit. The bride is the believers throughout centuries who are already in the New Jerusalem. They're the ones who have made a profession of faith and invited Christ into their lives and experienced the, the salvation, the, the forgiveness that God offers. So the spirit and the bride are telling those outside the gates to come in. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, and even with the sheep and the goats, you know, you see, you see the separation, but you you got to wonder, you know, what what whoa, who are those goats? You know, was I a goat? Because I was pretty religious, you know. And you go through these trials and tribulations and restorative judgments, even in your life now. I feel like you know, like. God's always refining us. And um, you can, I can relate to the sheeps. I can relate to the goats. But it, for me, the danger comes when you have this definitive, this is who I am. Um, and therefore, there's an us and them kind of complex that happens. Like, I'm a believer. That's an unbeliever. And, and it creates just this really divisive um, structure, doesn't it, that that ends up just toxic. Um, yeah, to and it's interesting too, Nissa. I think um, we're at a time in history where you you had a long time, fifteen hundred years, and then all of a sudden, you, actually, about a thousand years, where then the Reformation came along, which I think restored a lot of good things to the church, but it didn't restore restore everything. Um, what happened in the Reformation was you had something that was different than had ever been in the history of the world. That's called the printing press, where suddenly people, the common person, was able to actually read and get in touch with things that before only those who were in the, uh, the academy, the, the, the colleges, universities, uh, or in the church, they were the only ones that could read this. And all of a sudden, it becomes something that everyone can read. Yeah. Well, now we have something called the internet. It was interesting because when I started to do my research in 1978, I had to be in a theological library. In 2007, I could actually read Origen, and I could read Gregory of Nyssa and uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Mopsuestia by going to the internet. I could read other people that agreed with this particular position, which, by the way, I thought when I wrote my paper, I was the only person in the 20th century who had... Uh, who was convinced that the scriptures were true and that God was going to restore all of creation. And uh, then I found out later that, no, there were other people as well that mm -hmm. uh, 
that believed in this. But you can get into that uh, understanding now because of the internet. It makes information available much more so than it had been before. And now, I, I, I don't know what your marriage relationship is or whatever, but I know people, good friend of mine, his wife is Jewish. Mm -hmm. Christian. Yeah. Well, does that mean that she's going to go to hell forever? Mm -hmm. That's my wife or yeah. my children. I know yeah. many people that have children that are not walking with God mm. and or parents that are not walking with God, God or relatives that are not walking with God or people they work with. You know, I, I, um, I was uh, recently, I, <laughs> I was out um, doing some uh, campaigning for a political uh, figure and knocked on doors. And there were a couple of people that were from India. There were a couple that were from Muslim world, the Arabic world. My daughter lives in um, the Middle East. And so I was able to say to the Arabic people, Salam Alaikum, which means, uh, how are you? you know, and they would say Alaikum Salam. Um, and, uh, but you suddenly now have people, it's not those people over there, it's these people right here. Mm -hmm. Maybe my wife or my husband or my child or my uncle or my relative down uh, or my uh, uh, neighbor down the street or my coworker that I work with. Suddenly it's not this us and them thing that it used to be. In the past, you grew up in a small town. Basically you heard the, the preacher tell you <clears throat> every Sunday, you know, the message of Christ. And so you were without excuse in that sense. Right. Uh, but now you find out, well, gosh, these people over in India, they're very nice people. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to send them to hell forever. Mm -hmm. So uh, that those are various reasons for doing different things. But it seems to me that um, the only, if God, if you start out with a God who's all powerful, all wise, all loving and good, mm -hmm. and he creates a very good creation, mm -hmm. then I would expect that the end would also be very good. And the best way to see that happening is that God is ultimately going to restore everyone, that everyone will come to a point where they recognize their need for God's saving grace through Christ. Uh, I think it was Thomas or Theodore of Mopsuestia, maybe then Gregory of Nyssa as well, um, made the point that uh, sin always leads to misery. Uh -huh. So if you continue in sin long enough, come to the point of realizing this is just stupid. I got to get out of it. That's why alcoholics will, some will turn away from alcohol in their 30s, some in their 40s, some 50s, some not till their 70s. But in almost every case when they do, it's because their lives have been ruined. They've mm -hmm. lost their family. They've lost their health. They've lost their income. They've lost their houses, all these different kinds of things. And they realize this is just plain stupid. I got to stop. Yeah. So the same thing will happen ultimately as people come to the end of their rope, they pursue sin for a certain degree of time, whether it's in this life or in the ages to come. And then they realize this is just dumb. I need God's saving grace through Christ. And it's through Christ because Christ died for the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. And he said at the end, it is finished. He accomplished what he came to do. He came to seek and save the lost and he accomplished what he came to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've even heard, you know, God as a consuming fire mm. and him being that consuming fire can also be, uh, it could be intimidating if, if you've lived your life in sin, let's just say the word, let's say a terrible example, you know, somebody who just like terrible sin their whole life. And then the all consuming fire of God's love, his love is his wrath that can almost Re, you react the opposite way and push them away and eventually it's it's got to be that choice right that you choose to embrace that union because you can you can still choose to be outside the gates right yeah. so so right. All, it'll be a choice and they'll all come to that choice and yeah go. my favorite verse along those lines is uh paul's comment where he says Basically, at the end of time, every knee will bow. Yeah. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Mm -hmm. The word confess in that particular verse means to give voluntary, willing yeah. praise. In fact, it's yeah. a, in the Septuagint, that word is used to give 
praise to God. So all those people will voluntarily, freely come and bow before God the Father, or before Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Mm. And so uh, that, to me, says it's going to happen. I, I, I was in a discussion with a theologian a few years ago, a uh, brilliant man, who believed in the annihilation of the wicked, that, that the wicked would, at the end of time, be annihilated, totally destroyed. Well, you know, it's possible, but it's not going to happen. Because he thought, well, you know, somebody might decide that just forever just to, to, to turn their back on God. I said, well, you know, it's possible. I don't think that'll happen, but I know it won't happen because Paul says every knee will bow, every tongue will freely confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. And God does not accept feigned praise. He doesn't mm -hmm. accept hypocritical praise. Uh, he wants that praise to be true. Yeah. He doesn't like hypocrites. So, so beautiful, but yet still the elephant in the room. And, you know, that's so I was going to end with just like how long, you know, I, I just wonder sometimes why um, people, no matter what you, what you tell them, you'll say verses like that, but um, there's still this like want, want to hold on to your old belief for some reason. And I wonder if, if it has to do with, like for me, it just looks, it, it seems so obvious, um, but you know, I, I humble myself. I mean, I, I too, you know, just like everyone has, have misinterpreted scripture, you know? So what, what do we do to sort of bring people back to that kind of like humble, let's, let's look at this kind of thing. Um, Cause I, I, I people just like, they just sort of just don't want to even go there. Um, but I think it's because people are afraid. Don't people freeze. are afraid to go there. Um, yeah. And legitimately afraid because how can you, George Saris, or how can you, Nissa, be right when for 500 years, for 1500 years, everybody, at least the large majority, especially in the Western church, have said that uh, people are going to be suffering consciously forever in hell. Who yeah. are you? You know, uh, by the way, it's, it's not, it's view was not ever a um a heretical view within the eastern it was uh and not even actually in the uh western church um not officially but uh in the protestant church it is kind of you don't have the same kind of um litur liturgical hierarchy in the in the uh, protestant church that you have in the either roman catholic or eastern orthodox but i think it's it's a legitimate concern you know people um in fact when i first started writing my paper in seminary in 1978, my wife said to me, George, you gotta be careful here. <laughs> you know, you realize what you're doing? Yeah. And as we talked about it, and as we went to say, showed her some things, she became convinced this was correct as well, but it's a, it's a very big step. And so, mm -hmm. and what I found too, is that the average person is actually fairly open to this. Yes, yes. It's the professional theologian or the professional person who's been teaching this for years. They're the ones that are against it. Yeah. So it's almost like when Jesus came, you've got the Pharisees who are the professional theologians. They're against what he has to say. The average people, they think it's really pretty cool stuff. Yeah. So, um, it, it really is. Uh, it's born out of fear that how can this be correct when everybody else has told me that it isn't. But once they start reading some information about it, people get excited. Yeah, yeah, that that bring up in their in their gut, like this isn't from, and we just follow follow the rabbit trail. Look at this passage; it leads to this passage, and it's just a beautiful unraveling. Yeah. In my book, by the way, I uh, I address the beginning part is on the history, looking mm -hmm. at historically where did this view, where was it, how did it originate, um, yeah. originate, and then where what happened to it. And then the second part is answering all the various objections that people have. Yeah. Like 46, uh, 2546 verse. Um, uh, what about uh, what about Judas? You know, yeah. when Jesus says to him, it would be better uh, if you had not even been born. That's a pretty heavy thing. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, but all or how about the rich man of Lazarus? You know, that, that parable that, that Jesus gives. So anyway, I address all of those specific issues in the second part of my book. Yeah. Uh, but those are things that need to be addressed because people need to have, they've heard 
the idea of endless punishment for so long that they need to have something that gives them that gives credibility to the fact that no this may not be correct right right yeah the apologetic apologetic in you i, I definitely see that in your work <laughs> of it i'm curious about your next book why don't we um talk about that before we go because i know i've yeah. kept longer than <laughs> I, I do i have a meeting uh in a little bit of time but the, the, the book is titled and i'm hoping to get it published before the end of the year. I would love to be able to get it published before December, but I don't know if that'll happen. Uh, the manuscript is basically done. I've had a, a friend who's a, a great editor. He's edited it. He's the one that edited my other book as well. And um, part of the problem is that the person who does the typesetting lives in Fort Myers Beach, Florida. So the hurricane that came a couple of weeks ago totally destroyed her house. I mean, oh. nothing was salvageable. So I don't want to uh, press her too much to say, hey, you got to get my book done, you know, because oh. that's not going to work. But the title of the book is Searching for Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Oh, okay, I'm writing this. Truth in Vegas, Hollywood, and Bethlehem. Oh. And it looks at issues like evolution. Uh, it looks at issues like Eastern mysticism. And it's basically a, a, an, a book to be given away to people that have honest questions about the nature of God, the nature of life, and the validity of biblical Christianity. So it's kind of an introduction to biblical Christianity. And uh, that's In time for Christmas, you think? Well, I don't know. I hope so. I don't know. I'm hoping that it will. That would be a great time to be able to have it. Very good. Thank <laughs> you for your time. Well, I enjoyed Yeah, I enjoyed this. And I look forward to listening to it again. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you can go to um, uh, Amazon.com, Heaven's Doors, Wider Than You Ever Believed by George W. Saris. And uh, you can get it as an audio book, as a printed book, or as an ebook. And um, I'm the narrator. So <laughs> there you go. Well, it's been a privilege and an honor. Thank you. It's been a delight for me as well. Yeah. Okay, well, take care. You want to pray us out? Yeah. Lord God, we do thank you for the privilege of knowing you as a father who never abandons his children and a father who loves us so much that he did send his own son to uh, provide the way that we could get back into fellowship with you. Um, mm -hmm. And Lord God, I just pray that you will continue to strengthen us, you will guide us, that you will continue to lead us into the truth so that... Um, as we talk about our faith with others, it will be encouraged, uplifted, and given freedom to know the true God who loves all of his children. Yes. Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for that. Beautiful. This was great. I, I, feel, I feel the glory. <laughs> Good. It's been a delight for us. And I just, I love how, you know, you just articulate everything so well. The manifestations um, are so different for each person uh, mm -hmm. it, that I come across. It just, I just love it. You just shine. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That's encouraging. Thank you. God bless. All right. Have a good meeting. Bye-bye.